Well, I have an extremely special guest with us today. Sri, a 17 year old value investor. He's the host of the Market Champions podcast, the founder of Elite Investor. You can find him easily uh, on Twitter, Instagram, all the media platforms. Uh, Sri, you have something like, what, 150 uh, videos just from Elite Investor alone? I think so. It's more like I have 150 podcasts, but then uh, I don't have 150 you know, videos because I started the YouTube act, uh, after I started the podcast. I started the YouTube at the end of last year. And so it's got videos from there, but it doesn't have like, you know, every single episode. So, yeah. That's great. And I'm kind of curious out of the gate, you know, you've interviewed so many, frankly, the best minds in global macro and finance. Uh, and you've, you must have had this huge bucket till currently of all these different perspectives, uh, different turns and twists in macro theory, um, you know, theses and whatnot. So with that being said, what is your macro thesis, whether it's combined with all these different perspectives or, you know, originated from your own thesis? For sure. So, uh, now, if I'm being, you know, completely honest, you know, if anyone's being completely honest, you know, most, uh, uh, most people, uh, most people, including me, don't really have, you know, a complete idea of what's actually going on. And uh, I think that, I think that's sort of, uh, it's sort of like a debate right now between sort of the inflationist and the deflationist. And I'm sort of in the middle ground there, because I don't think we're going to end up seeing, you know, the, I don't think we're going to end up seeing, say, you know, negative five percent, you know, deflation. Now, I also don't think we're going to see, you know, hyperinflation. I think we're just, I think we're just going to, you know, continue kicking the can down the road. And uh, from a cyclical standpoint, it, you know, it looks pretty bearish for the U.S. dollar. And you know, that's sort of my, that's sort of the major thing that I've been looking at. Which means that, you know, if there is a pullback in, you know, emerging markets, if there's like a correction in emerging market stocks but that's something i've been looking into and you know if there's sort of an opportunity to get emerging market companies and you know the things with exposure to emerging markets you know that's something that i've been looking at and yeah that's sort of uh, that's one thing but then sort of my major expertise is in you know so sort of identifying value trying to find you know good companies or, you know, just in general, finding cheap companies, you know, that trade below their intrinsic value, you know, following sort of, uh, you know, the Ben Graham style of investing, you know, you're, you're able to find a lot of these, you know, amazing value plays, especially when you look at, you know, micro cap companies and small cap companies. And that's sort of, you know, that's sort of where, you know, I do most of my investing. And so far, macro has just been an interest and it's just something that, you know, I found interesting. But then, you know, overall, I do think I do think that you know the macro is important, and you know it's not something that you can leave. You know you can leave for you know the macro guys, and you know I'm a value guy, and therefore I'm not going to focus on the macro. I don't think it works like that. I think that you know you you still have to look at the macro, try to try to understand the macro picture, what's going on, and you know, and how you're how you know how that influences what you, you know, what you own. You know, there's a there's a great investor. His name is uh, Scott Besson who learned from, you know, the legendary Stanley Druckenmiller. And, you know, this, he, you know, he's quoted as saying, that, you know, if you own an airline stock, you know, you're making a macro bet on the price of oil because the price of oil affects, you know, the jet fuel prices, which influences the profits of your airline. So, you know, every stock in that sense is sort of influenced by the macro. And, you know, in 2008, at the Value Investing Congress, you know, David Einhorn, who's a pretty much a legendary value investor himself, and he talked about how, yeah, uh, you know, uh, before the 2008 financial crisis, you know, sort of complacent about the macro. He didn't really care about the macro picture. But then after that, you know, he started focusing on, you know, what's going on in the macro. He started focusing on, you know, what's going on, uh, you know, from the top down perspective. And that, but as he went to some conference before that, where Stanley Druckenmiller had explained, you know, why housing, why housing markets were, you know, sort of getting bubbly. Uh, or, you know, well, financial markets as a whole are like, sort of getting bubbly. And, you know, he said that, you know, that's sort of a top-down thing, you know, that's not for me. I mean, I'm not, I'm probably not going to, you know, focus on that. But then at the end of the day, you know, there were the, the top-down ended up mattering as well. So I think it's important to know it's very hard to make macro calls and get them right. 
and you know, uh, and you know, uh, I'm sticking to what I know for now. So I'm sticking to following my value investing strategy. But then, you know, so far, macro's been an interest, and you know, it's been awesome to talk to you know, a lot of these you know macro guys and you know get their perspective on how things are going. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's fantastic. And it's funny you say, because uh, especially since the past year, uh, rapid rotation throughout different dynamics within the macro economy, uh, it, it's so rapid. Uh, what's been, for example, uh, just two weeks ago, the reflation trade has, you know, everybody was thinking inflation, inflation, you know, higher prices everywhere. Although we are seeing that across many sectors across the economy, it hasn't taken to fruition in headline CPI. Uh, right. Obviously base effects, you know, we haven't seen a significant mm -hmm. overshoot, but we did see like a point, you know, 10 basis point, uh, you know, exceeding above expectations, uh, you know, so it's not really that significant, maybe see over 3%, uh, you know, throughout this second half as well this year. So really, given this rapid rotation between narratives, so we had the reflation narrative, now it's uh, not so much, uh, right? Yields started pushing back significantly yesterday on the long end and, you know, weird things are happening, like the, the divergence between volatility, uh, you know, actual CBOE volatility, you know, that, that's, that's condensing, that's staying at a very condensed territory while you have vol of vol, volatility of volatility, actually the past few weeks has been climbing. It's been surging. So that divergence, it hasn't happened apparently since March of 2020. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we all know what happened then. So my question is, you know, and you know this better than anybody else. I mean, there's so many signs pointing to, you know, now is an inflection point for equities or just capital markets in general. And, you know, what is your thinking behind that? Uh, do you foresee the momentum in, you know, big growth tech to be the most, uh, you know, sensitive to rising interest rates? Uh, you know, what's your thinking behind it all? Yeah, so uh, I think that's a good question. And, you know, I think the, the sort of the major part of that is, you know, your, uh, now I don't think that anyone can sort of call tops and, you know, figure out, you know, whether, you know, whether we're sort of seeing another, you know, end of February 2020 kind of moment right now. I do think that, you know, sort of, you know, valuations are stretched and, you know, I think the reflation uh, and, you know, sort of sentiment is a little, you know, through the roof, it's very, very bullish. But again, you know, as we all know, you know the bubbles can go on forever. And, you know, can, and, you know if we're going to be short a bubble, like, you're probably going to lose a lot of money, you know, being short that bubble. And when you talk about, uh, you know, I, I haven't really looked into the impact of, say, the higher rates on what happens to, uh, uh, you know, higher yields and what happens to, you know, tech stocks and so on and so forth. I haven't taken a look at that, so I don't really have an opinion. All I know is that, you know, usually historically, uh, you know, if you have like ridiculously, you know, high double digit rates of inflation, like we saw in the 1970s, we might see, you know, stocks and, you know, PE multiples as a whole get crushed. But, you know, I don't think we're going to see any of uh, any of that kind of thing. I don't think we're going to end up seeing, you know, 1970s kind of inflation. I do think we might see, uh, I don't, uh, no, I think we might see a moderate amount of inflation maximum, but uh, I'm not expecting any kind of hyperinflation that requires, you know, say, you know, 10 or 20% you know, interest rates the way that they had it, you know, uh, back then with Paul Volcker, so. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and even uh, recent economic data, like obviously we had a very significant print in the ISM data. And, you know, I mean, that's, you know, record prices across the board. You know, we're seeing a margin squeeze for manufacturers. It's, uh, you know, the question is though, how fast is that gonna pass on to the consumers uh, for consumer prices? So it's kind of already starting. Um, it's been starting for some sectors of the economy. Uh, especially food prices. Um, so it's just very interesting. And specifically with the ISM PMI, when that level is, I wish we had charts to actually like prove our points here. Uh, we love our charts. You know, if it's above 60, the PMI, typically that's, again, a sign of an inflection point for stocks. 
um, you know, just look back at the chart. It's, it's very, very well correlated to that kind of dynamic. Um, so, you know, all signs point to the downside, at least some kind of blimp, um, but yet the S&P continues marching higher and higher. Uh, the Russell 2K is an animal of its own. Uh, it's a, essentially it's zombified. Uh, you know, there's so many companies within the Russell 2K that are completely zombie companies where, where if viewers don't know what a zombie company is, it's essentially just a company that pays their interest payments with debt. Um, in other words, what the, what the government is doing. So, you know, uh, that's a whole nother interview, though, what the government is doing in terms of zombifying itself. But let's move on to the next question, which is, um, you know, do you believe or rather if and when do you think the Fed will start tapering? Because we saw it happen post World War II, post 1945, excuse me, for about a decade or so. And, you know, kept the tenure of what, 200 bips or 2%, something like that. And, you know, there's many occurrences after that as well. What's not to make it happen again? Yeah, so, you know, when the Fed tapers, you know, that's that's basically a question of, you know, when start when things start to get you know, more and more inflationary. And, you know, the Fed has basically said that, you know, they're going to keep rates low until 2023, 2024. You know, they're going to keep rates low for a fairly long time and you know, until the U.S. gets uh, you know, 100% back on track. So I think that, I think that you know, if you, go, if you look at sort of the euro dollar futures market over, you know, over the sort of the last decade, you know, they've been wrong about rate hikes for a very long time. And, you know, that's, that's, that's part of what goes into when you think about this. Uh, you know, if you go look at, you know, interest rate futures, they end up, uh, the historically, the Fed have not been a very good predictor of when you know when interest rates actually rise. So I think that the catalyst for the Fed tapering is you know when we uh, when we end up having inflation, uh, you know when you have inflation, the Fed will have to sort of raise rates, and you know they want to let inflation run hot. So I think you know if inflation ever runs hot, you know they're probably going to let it be at least for a while. Because they they want to follow you know sort of average inflation targeting, so making sure that the average of all the inflation between you know now and the next uh, between now and twenty thirty or whenever they pick their date is two percent. So I think uh, unless sort of inflation runs extremely hot, I don't think you know they're going to end up raising rates anytime soon. And you know even with base effects, you know we're not seeing any big print on the CPI. And you know we had or the number yesterday was. 2.6 or 2.7 percent. I believe the number came out three days ago or so. And you know, we didn't see anything crazy with, with the base effects. And you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see what happens, especially when we go look at you know July and August, because the next three months were pretty crap last year. So there is a there's a major portion of all this, you know, inflation, but it's really just base effects. And you know, the fact that the CPI collapsed. Uh, at this time last year, and therefore, you now it's uh, therefore the major focus is going to be on, uh, you know, what happens after the next quarter. So what happens in July, August, September, and seeing, you know, if uh, if number one, the vaccines are going to drastically increase inflation because once we reopen the U.S., you know, we uh, and you know, if, uh, and I've seen charts that show that you know the personal savings rate as a whole is kind of, the amount of money that the person that people have saved is kind of much higher this recession compared to previous recessions. And, and that's sort of a catalyst for spending. And when spending goes up with no real growth, you know, we're, we're probably gonna end up seeing inflation. And so it's gonna, I think it's gonna be interesting to watch, but I don't really have a view on it. So, you know, <laughs> uh, and again, it goes back to what I said at the start, you know, most people who, you know, make these wild calls, they probably don't have a clue what's going on either. And, you know, it's not easy to have a clue on you know, what's going on in the macro. That's what number one makes it so exciting. And number two, you know, if it was easy to just say, you know, the Fed is printing so much money, buy gold, you know, the Fed is not printing anything at all, just buy the dollar, you know, it would be very easy to become rich. But you know, as you see, neither of the two assets, neither the dollar nor gold has done you no know, well at all. So yeah. Absolutely. Very insightful that that response. And it's interesting because People are saying so much liquidity is getting pumped into the economy. It's the opposite. Credit's contracting across the board. 
Um, in fact, China's, you probably see in China's uh, credit impulse on a six month rolling base uh, is negative. So it's kind of mm -hmm. crazy. And, um, you know, you know, the money multiplier is down, the mon uh, monetary velocity is down to record lows. Um, so money is really not flowing in the economy. Uh, in fact, it's pretty much frozen. Dollars are actually being destroyed. Um, like, you know, the thing is that, you know, a lot of what goes on in the market is a result of, you know, the ex expectations and what the central bankers are saying, not what the central bankers are doing. And, you know, well, when they have this, when the market has this expectation or this belief that there's a ton of liquidity being pumped in, the market goes up just based off of that, even if there is no real liquidity. So it's sort of the narrative that's in the market that's more important than what's actually going on in the market. Right, absolutely. The market's always right at the end. Um, it's, what is it? It's just the Federal Reserve, China, Japan, that are really just the three biggest holders of U.S. Treasury debt. Um, it's kind of amazing. And the rest are just scattered in fractions of that. Um, but anyways, we don't have too much time left. Um, so I just have one last question, if you don't mind, and mm -hmm. uh, try and make it as brief as possible, which is what is, how can you best explain, uh, you know, what quantitative easing is? Um, yeah, sure. So, uh, I didn't make a thread on this on my Twitter, which you can go and find at Ali underscore investor. Um, I think that uh, so what Q uh, so the thing that QE is not it's not it's not you know money printer goes burr it's not you know people it's not the it's not the government going around dropping money off a helicopter you know and that's that's not what it is it's basically the fact that uh, so how it works is you know banks go and buy these treasuries and then they flip it over to the Fed. For an IOU or debt, or, or uh, you know, in, it's a, it's a, it's not really debt. It's an IOU, but you know, they get a small interest payment on it from the Federal Reserve, and you know, it's called a bank reserve. And you know that, uh, and you know, you can't really go around and you know spend money with that bank reserve, and you can you know take you cannot take that bank reserve and you know go to a restaurant and eat food. You know that, that's not how it works, and goal of QE is to increase the bank reserves and you know make sure that banks land but you know unless the banks actually land we're not going we're not going to see any you know real growth of any form and I think you know that's that's sort of what most people get wrong they think that QE is money printing when it's not it's the exchange of reserves uh, for treasuries from, uh, so the Federal Reserve you know exchanges uh, reserve uh, so the Federal Reserve Bank exchanges reserves uh, exchanges these bank reserves, which pay a small interest rate to the bank, to the commercial banks, and the commercial banks give uh, the treasuries in return. And yeah, the reason the uh, reason the commercial banks do this is uh, number one, they they get a small interest rate on it called the interest on excess reserves. The reserves are basically a very safe asset. And then the third thing is it's it's superior to holding cash because if you have to because when a bank has cash, you know they have to pay and make sure that it's in a vault or it's sort of a safely, et cetera. Uh, and you know there's there's cost to keeping it safe, there's cost to maintaining the cash as it is. But then you know when you have a reserve, you know it's just a pure balance, uh, it's a it's a pure transaction on the balance sheet, and you know, they get paid a small level of interest for it, and therefore you know, they're able to they're able to serve, you know. It's, they're sort of able to get by just just on that small interest rate, and you know, unless the banks lend against these bank reserves, we're not going to end up seeing, you know, uh, or at least you know, the thesis of the deflation is just that we're not going to end up seeing any growth, and that the solution will have to be, you know, the government comes in and forces the banks to lend. But you know, I don't know. We'll have to see what happens. So yeah, yeah, we'll have to see what happens. Uh, the whole SLR thing, uh, the whole nine yards, but. More to come. The action just gets crazier and crazier day by day. Um, but in the meantime, Sri, it's been a real pleasure having you on board here. Um, Thanks for having me. Of course. Yeah. But before we go, would you like to share with the viewers um, how they could find you, how they could find your Twitter, their, you know, your work, your, uh, you know, your podcast? How could they find you? Yeah, sure. So uh, you can find my Twitter at Ali underscore investor. You can find my Instagram at elite.investor. And uh, my YouTube is just my name, uh, S-R-I-V-A-T-S-A-N space P-R-A-K-A-S-H. Um, 
And you can find my podcast by just searching for Market Champions on Google. You'll probably, and you can probably find it on a platform of your choice like iTunes or Spotify or Google Podcasts. And yeah, that's about it. Great. That's awesome. And thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome talking to you.